Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Out Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. And just a quick little note here, if anything sounds or seems a little weird with this podcast, or if I sound a little bit hesitant on some things, I just updated my computer and the recording software right now is doing some really weird things. So bear with me here. I hope this actually records. Fingers crossed. So it's a Sunday night in early October. The skies are dark, but also dry. In the past four months, it's only rained half the normal amount, and this drought has been going on for the past year. A fireman rests, barely able to move from exhaustion. There'd been a raging fire the night before that took 18 hours to put out. In the past week alone, 24 other fires have been dealt with. The firemen, his crew, and the horses who pull the steam-powered water engines are out of energy. And then an alarm sounds. Another fire has been ignited. But there's no information coming from which direction to head. The delay would seal the fate of Chicago. Well, that's quite an ominous start to the podcast, isn't it? And you're probably wondering what in the world does the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 have to do with books? Especially since it happened in October. And you're like, where's the books? Where's some sort of January event? Don't worry. If I weave this tale just right, it'll all come around to books and to January. Or at least I hope so. Before we jump into the episode, though, another big dose of gratitude goes to Johnny Pongratz for sharing several episodes of the podcast over on the Johnson Hans blog. He's also been plowing through my historical fantasy series, Domna, and posting some very favorable reviews for it on his blog. If you want to check out what he's writing and learn more about Johnny's fiction writing, I've dropped the link to his site in the show notes, so please do head over there and give it a peek. And just one quick reminder before we get going, this show is supported by you, so please do check out the very inexpensive ways you can keep the episodes coming by just heading to that Support the Owl link in the show notes. Okay, cue the Billy Joel music, because it's time to start a fire. No, wait, Billy Joel said we didn't start the fire. Well, anyway, that's why this isn't the Music Owl podcast. So, the fire that would become known as the Great Chicago Fire started on the 8th of October, 1871. It was a Sunday night about 8 o'clock. And, like I said, fires had been popping up all over the place for the past week in Chicago. But this particular fire got the upper hand. Part of that was because the fire crews were completely done in. And this is saying a lot because at the time, with over 180 firemen, Chicago had one of the best fire departments in the U.S. But the firemen weren't entirely to blame. It was mainly how the fire alarm system worked. See, there were these fire call boxes scattered around the city, but your average Chicago Joe wasn't allowed access to them. Instead, only upstanding men of business or politics or society were given keys to the boxes. And the upstanding citizen in charge of the box nearest ground zero for the fire, well, he didn't really think he needed to send up the alarm just yet. Rather than pull the alarm, he got into a big old Karen-esque bickering session with the people telling him to sound the alarm. See, people just don't change. Another part of the city's fire defense system were these watchtowers that were scattered around town. And I don't know if the watchman that night was reading a book, dreaming about a special someone, or just taking a nap. But by the time the fires were spotted, they had already gotten out of control, which was why they didn't know what direction to tell the fire crews to head. And just as legend tells us, the fire did actually start at or near the O'Leary barn. The cow was indeed blamed, but the actual reason for that blame was because sentiment toward the Irish was so disparaging in Chicago at the time that it, it just became all too easy to blame Irish immigrants for the destruction. And so Kate O'Leary pretty much spent, you know, ended up living the rest of her life in disgrace after the fire. 
And as a little side note here, no one is really sure how the fire started in that barn. But in 1997, the Chicago City Council officially pardoned Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Better late than never, I guess. Anyway, Chicago isn't known as the Windy City for nothing. And the wind was blowing that night. Combine that with a city made mostly of wood, plus a year-long drought, and anything a wind-whipped ember touched was bound to go up in flames. People began trying to flee the city, and many took refuge by bodies of water. But even by the water, the ground, it just became too hot to bear. So rather than by the water, people headed into the water. The fire was so bad, it was described as moving in sheets of flame that reached a thousand feet wide and a hundred feet tall. I mean, you can't even roast marshmallows with fires that bad, right? Then, as if things aren't bad enough, you know, the marshmallows are totally burnt, things aren't bad enough, the fire reaches the gas works building, and kaboom, more fire, and the power went out. Then, at three in the morning, just, you know, add a little bit of something something on the bad something something, the damn fire is so bad, it ignites the waterworks station. The waterworks building, people. That is some serious fire. This ended up wiping out the pumps and cut off the water supply that the firemen could have really used. So things are not looking good for Chicago. And just like crews will do in forest wildfires these days, attempts were made to create fire breaks, but not by cutting down trees. They created these fire breaks, or attempted to, by blowing up buildings. Nice try, but it didn't work. The fire just kept coming. Finally, in the early hours of Tuesday, rain started pouring. It finally put out the fires, but by then, an area four miles by one mile had been burnt. 300 people died, over 17,000 buildings were destroyed, and 70 miles of streets were left in ruins. And worse yet for us book lovers, the Cobbs Library lost 5,000 books in the fire, and the Chicago Library Association lost a whopping 2 to 3 million books. Just tragedy. Pure tragedy. I'll give you a moment to grieve over that. Okay, moving on. And no, that wasn't the only book part of the episode. We're getting to that. So, obviously, we know Chicago rebuilt. And they rebuilt the city, not on rock and roll, but by using innovative designs and building materials, namely fireproof materials. Good thinking. But you don't care about that. You're probably still wondering what in the fiery bowels of Hades this has to do with books. Well, we need to head over to London for a minute. See, across the pond, word came in about the destruction, and a man named A.H. Burgess wanted to help out because he not only was a really nice guy, but he also happened to like the city of Chicago. With the support of a member of parliament, and he was also an author, by the name of Thomas Hughes, Burgess began a project called the English Book Donation. Yes, this is the book part. They ended up gathering over 8,000 books from people, including some pretty high-ranking folks, such as Benjamin Disraeli, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and Queen Victoria herself. When Burgess sent the books over, he included a statement that went, I propose that England should present a free library to Chicago, to remain there as a mark of sympathy now, and a keepsake and token of true brotherly kindness forever. The problem with this brotherly kindness was Chicago had no actual library system. Now, I hear you saying, but... Wait a minute, you just mentioned two libraries that lost millions of books. You're right, I did. But those libraries were not free and open to the public. They were subscription or members-only libraries, and that was really the only type of library available in Chicago at the time. But Burgess's donation sparked a fire, (coughs) sorry, sparked a fire under the people of Chicago. It gave them the gumption to petition for a free library system that would be open to the public. And this petitioning eventually worked its way up the system to become the Illinois Library Act of 1872. And that authorized tax-supported libraries throughout the state. Unfortunately, this is government, 
and it would take until 1873 for the first public library to actually open in Chicago. And that library opened, wait for it, on the 1st of January, 1873. I told you this episode had a January element to it. But the best part of this library was that it was started with about half of the books donated because of the fire. And, even better, it was housed in an old water tank. And if you're on the Book Owl podcast mailing list, you'll get a photo of that water tank library in the email that will go out with this episode. And it really is kind of a remarkable looking place. But, although clever and good looking, the tank, it really wasn't all that big, and it wasn't in a convenient spot for everyone in the ever-growing city to get to. The trouble was is that the city really wasn't focusing on building new libraries, so this is all there was. But people are clever, and instead, book depositories were created in existing businesses, such as candy stores and drug stores, which I think is absolutely appropriate because books are just as addictive as candy and drugs, in my opinion. Anyway, how this worked was you'd put in a request to the main library, and your stuff would be delivered by horse-drawn cart to the outpost nearest your home, and then you'd go pick up your book. And people must have loved this system, because over two-thirds of the Chicago Library's circulation came through these little outposts. And just to wrap up this whole Chicago thing, the city did eventually get a purpose-built library. And let me just say, this was when they knew how to build a library. This thing had a dome ceiling, a grand staircase, and glass lamps designed by Tiffany's. Swanky. So all this got me thinking about donations and what other libraries might have been started with donations. Of course, my own local library was started with the donations of both books and an entire house from Florence Letting. But obviously, that's not the only library ever started with donations. And so I started doing a little bit of research, and I discovered the first public library in the United States was actually started with book donations. And the story is kind of funny because that's not what was asked for. So it's around 1790, and this town in Pennsylvania named itself Franklin in a sort of, shall we say, butt-kissing attempt to attract Ben Franklin's attention. It did, and he asked what he could do for the city. So the city says, well, we'd just love to have a church bell to ding-dong people into Sunday service. Ben Franklin, a possible atheist, or at least agnostic from what I understand, said, Great, here's a pile of books instead. The town council decided not to complain and voted to lend the books to its citizens free of charge. And so, in 1790, in that year, what would become known as the Franklin Public Library opened. And that was the first library in the U.S. And then, you know, I was looking for another story and, (laughs) stupid me, I completely forgot about all the Carnegie libraries. Say what you will about him, but Andrew Carnegie loved books, and he had a ton of money. Actually, probably more than a ton if you actually, you know, weighed it all out. But the money he donated founded over 2,500 libraries, and these were built between 1883 and 1929. And these things are everywhere. Most of them are in the U.S., but you'll also find them in the U.K., Ireland, Australia, South Korea, Malaysia, and more, really, just all around. And if your New Year's resolution is to kind of clean up some of your bookshelves, there's plenty of places you can donate them besides Goodwill. You may not have enough to found your own library, but if you want to check out a few places that would love your books and will put them to good use... You can find a link to a post on the Book Owl podcast blog that will give you a nice little rundown of quite a few places. Okay, that is it for fires, for Ben Franklin, and for book donations. And that means it's update time. The big update is that this past Tuesday, the 12th of January, was release day for the second box set of my historical fantasy series, The Osteria Chronicles. And this set includes books four through six, plus a ton of... Okay, maybe not a ton, quite a few pieces of bonus material 
to really bring you into this world where the myths of ancient Greece come to life as you've never seen them before. The series has also just gotten all new covers that I think really show off the stories and the tone of the books perfectly. And as a little promo push to lure you guys into the books, I've priced the first box set, and that's books one through three, to 99 cents for the month of January. And the normal price is $5.99, so that's a pretty stellar deal if you want to give the series a try. Plus, if you purchase that box set from my PayHip bookstore, you'll also get a 15% discount on the second box set. Just You'll just automatically get that discount. So go pop over to that link in the show notes and venture into a new world. No, really, go to the link now. The show's over. What are you waiting for? Okay, my book-loving friends, that really is it for this episode. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you shared it with just one other person. And have a great couple weeks, and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. Audio processing by ophonic.com.